Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Friday, October 11th, 2024. All right, first thing, it is fundraising season at Antiwar.com. If you like this show, if you read Antiwar.com, and you have the means, please go over to antiwar.com slash donate. Help us out. We're trying to raise $100,000. We've raised about $10,000 so far this week. Um, We're hoping that we we could secure some some matching funds. Um, But this is how we we get by. We are entirely reliant on our readers. The money is very efficiently spent on running the site, paying the staff, paying the bills. Um, That's what this goes directly toward. And we are a nonprofit, so you could write it off your taxes. So whatever you give to us is less of your money that goes to the war machine that goes to funding these atrocities overseas. So antiwar.com slash donate, help us out. And if you donate, let me know so I could thank you. I appreciate everyone who's uh, who's helping us out. All right, the first story at the top of antiwar.com today. The U.S. and Israel are close to a consensus on attacking Iran. So Axios reported on Thursday that President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu moved closer to an understanding on Israel's plans to attack Iran during their phone call on Wednesday. So this is the same call that I went over yesterday that Harris sat in on as well. Um, This is more details about it from Axios. It says that the U.S. has accepted that Israel is going to launch a major attack on Iran, but they are apparently concerned that if they hit certain types of targets, it could escalate things too much. But I think either way, if Israel's launching a major attack on Iran, I mean, Iran's going to respond. This thing's going to blow up. Um, But anyway, the U.S. is, you know, they're warning against hitting the nuclear facilities, oil infrastructure, although Biden did say that they were talking about that at one point. An Israeli official told Axios that, that the Israeli plans are still a bit more aggressive than the U.S. would like. But I'm sure either way, the U.S. is going to be there to support the strikes in some way, either with intelligence or direct airstrikes, which is something that they're considering. Um, And even if they don't do those things, uh, they will defend Israel from whatever the consequences are. When when Iran hits back and Iran's going to know that that will be the case. So I think there's a chance that, say, Israel hits Iran hard and then Iran, you know, they're saying that they're going to launch a heavier attack than those 200 ballistic missiles they fired. Well, if they're going to do that and they know the U.S. is going to be helping defending them, they might start targeting some U.S. bases, try to overwhelm the air, the, the U.S. air defenses in the region. You know, they can get help from the from Hezbollah, from from the militias in Iraq and Syria. So, you know, it'll put U.S. troops right in the crosshairs. And this is what we're dealing with. Uh, I mean, Congress isn't even in session. There's no debate. There's no even conversation about this. They're just like getting ready to support a big Israeli attack on Iran that could easily turn into a full-blown war between the U.S. and Iran. Uh, So Netanyahu convened his security cabinet on Thursday to brief them on the situation with the U.S. And he's expected, he was expected to get approval for him and Gallant, the Israeli defense minister, to set a timeline on the attack. So the Times of Israel reported that the U.S. and Israel will continue conversations on these plans in the coming days, signaling the attack is not imminent. I think it looks like Gallant is going to go to the U.S. next week. Uh, but you never know. I mean, they could they could do this at any moment. Could be a few days, could be a few weeks. Uh, only time will tell, and then we'll see how this thing escalates. Um All right, so the next one here, Israeli strikes in central Beirut kill 22. So Israeli strikes hit two residential buildings in two separate neighborhoods in central Beirut on Thursday, killing at least 22 people and wounding 117. According to al Mayadeen, one strike hit the third floor of an eight-story building, and the other strike completely collapsed a four-story building. The death toll could rise as rescuers continue to search through the rubble. This strike marks the third time that Israel has targeted central Beirut since it escalated strikes on Lebanon in September. Um, Most Israeli strikes on the capital city focus on the southern suburbs, 
um, that they've really been bombing that area. Um, but this is um, they're expanding their airstrikes into other parts of Beirut. A uh, Hezbollah source told Al Mayadeen that the strikes were an assassination attempt on Wafik Safa, who heads Hezbollah's coordination and liaison unit, but he survived the attack. Reuters also reported that he eluded the assassination attempt. And these Israeli strikes hit a very densely populated part of Beirut. And a Lebanese security source told Reuters that among the dead was a family of eight, including three children who evacuated southern Lebanon to flee Israeli airstrikes. So they evacuated the south only to be killed by Israeli airstrikes in Beirut. Um, And these strikes came two days after Netanyahu said that he would turn Lebanon into Gaza, that Lebanon would see the same destruction of Gaza if they don't free themselves from Hezbollah, was how he put it. Um, And Israel has also escalated its ground campaign. And the next one here, uh, Israeli troops fire on UN peacekeepers in southern Lebanon. So the UN's peacekeeping mission in southern Lebanon, uh, known as UNIFIL, they said Thursday that is the Israeli Defense Forces fired on its on the UN positions multiple times, and two peacekeepers were wounded by an Israeli tank. UNIFIL said its headquarters in the town of Nakora and several nearby positions came under repeated Israeli attacks. UNIFIL said, quote, This morning, two peacekeepers were injured after an IDF Merkava tank fired its weapon toward an observation tower at UNIFEL's headquarters in Nakora, directly hitting it and causing them to fall, end quote. UNIFIL said the injuries were not serious, but the two wounded peacekeepers remain in the hospital. The statement said that the IDF also fired on a UN position in the town of La Labuna, quote, hitting the entrance to the bunker where peacekeepers were sheltering and damaging vehicles and a communication system, end quote. Um, And a day earlier, they fired on that same position and disabled uh, perimeter monitoring cameras. So they were taking out some of their cameras that the UN peacekeepers have. And these attacks come after the Israeli military told UNIFIL to abandon its positions in southern Lebanon. And UNIFIL and Ireland, which has a number of peacekeepers deployed in the area, both rejected the Israeli call. Uh, according to the Irish Times, none of the Irish peacekeepers were wounded. There is a specific outpost that's manned by Irish soldiers that Israel told to evacuate, but they, they're staying put. Um, and it's estimated that about 15,000 Israeli troops have invaded southern Lebanon, and now they're just firing openly, deliberately firing at the uh, the UN peacekeepers there. I mean, it just shows they're Israel's totally out of control, a complete rogue state that's armed with nuclear weapons, that's carrying out a genocide in Gaza. I mean, and and now they're shooting at the UN peacekeepers in southern Lebanon. And this is what Biden is uh, backing, you know, 100 percent. This is all being funded and supported by by the U.S. government. This just rampage that Israel is on. Uh, All right. So the next one here, Israel kills 28 Palestinians sheltering at a school in Gaza. So on Thursday, Israeli strikes targeted a school-turned-shelter for displaced Palestinians in Deir al-Bala, central Gaza, killing at least 28 and wounding 54. Gaza's health ministry said the number of dead and wounded was based on bodies and injured people who were brought to the hospitals and morgues, meaning that the, the death toll in this strike could rise. The breakdown of the casualties is unclear, but footage and photos of the aftermath that I looked through show that many women and children were killed and wounded. Uh, an Al Jazeera reporter who arrived on the scene, Tarek Abu Azum, said, quote, Children and women were torn to pieces by the intensity of the strike. I saw with my own eyes lots of bodies that were torn to pieces, making it quite hard to identify them unless family members managed to find out who they were from some signs in their clothing in the hospital morgue, end quote. Um, you see this little girl who's being treated at the Al-Aqsa hospital uh, after the strike. And there's a lot of really horrific pictures that came out of this. Um, so there's a Palestinian in the air who was there uh, at the scene of the strike when the bomb hit. And he told Middle East Eye, uh, quote, I get out and all I see is shreds of bodies all over the floor, heads blown up, innocent children scattered across the floor, end quote. So as usual, the Israeli military claimed that it targeted a Hamas command and control center, but offered no evidence for the claim. Schools sheltering displaced 
Palestinians have become very frequent targets of the Israeli military. Um, and strikes continue to cross other parts of Gaza on Thursday, including in the north. They're still ramping up in the north where they're telling everybody to leave, trying to carry out this ethnic cleansing campaign. And Gaza's health ministry said that at least 55 Palestinians were killed and 166 were wounded in the previous 24-hour period, bringing its death toll since last October to 42,065 and the number of wounded to 97,886. These figures don't include the Palestinians who are missing and presumed dead under the rubble. Um, and we had that group of American healthcare workers who were in Gaza. They estimate the true death toll, factoring in other causes, is over 118,000. Um, and uh, I link to their the appendix to their letter if people want to check it out. Um, check out the appendix of, of this open letter that we wrote about the other day because it, it has all their research and their reasoning uh, for, for reaching that toll, um, if you want to kind of dig into that more. Uh, all right, so the next one here, UN inquiry says that Israel is deliberately hitting Gaza health facilities. This article is from Al Jazeera. United Nations investigators have accused Israel of deliberately targeting Gaza's health facilities and killing medical personnel during its war on the besieged enclave. And I mean, this isn't even... You know, obviously, they're deliberately targeting health facilities. I mean, they're, they've been openly attacked. They've openly attacked every single hospital in Gaza at one point. You know, they claim that they're doing it because of Hamas. But again, those doctors, those American doctors that were there, they said that they did not see any sign of militant activity at the hospitals that they were working at. Um, that's what they all said, 99 of them. Um, so a statement by ex-UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, released on Thursday in advance of a full report, accused Israel of, quote, committing war crimes and the crime against humanity of extermination with relentless and deliberate attacks on medical personnel and facilities, end quote. So uh, he goes on, quote, children in particular have borne the brunt of these attacks, suffering both directly and indirectly from the collapse of the health system, end quote. Um, the UN's inquiry statement also accused Israeli forces of deliberately killing and torturing medical personnel, targeting medical vehicles, and restricting patients from leasing, leaving Gaza. So this is something that those American healthcare workers said as well, that the Palestinians who they worked with, uh, many of them were kidnapped by the IDF, you know, and tortured. Um, they all had these, uh, not all of them, but many of them were, you know, targeted and, uh, you know, picked up and, and humiliated and tortured by the Israeli military. And these people are doctors and nurses trying to keep people alive. <clears throat> um, so it looks like they're going to put out a full report uh, soon. Here's some numbers from Gaza's media office. At least 986 medical workers killed and at least 85 civil defense workers uh, have been killed. All right, so the next one here, Israel jails American journalist Jeremy Lafredo. So I talked about this a bit yesterday. We had some more details come out on Thursday. So Jeffrey Lafredo, an American journalist for the Gray Zone, has been arrested by the Israeli military for his reporting inside Israel. Lafredo was jailed just a few days after releasing a report on Iranian missile strikes in Israel, information the Israeli military has been trying to censor. According to the Israeli news site Ynet, because of the report, Lafredo faces charges of, quote, aiding the enemy during wartime and providing information to the enemy, end quote. So those sound like very serious charges. So it's, it's concerning what they might try to do to him. And representatives from the U.S. Embassy attended a hearing on a police request to extend Lafredo's detention. But so far, the U.S. government has been silent and has not publicly called for his release. Compare this to when uh, Gershkovitz, Evan Gershkovitz, the Wall Street Journal reporter, was arrested in Russia. Immediately, they made a huge deal about it. Nothing so far as of this recording on Thursday night. Um, so, And I put the report that he got arrested over in the story. It's short. It's only six minutes. He does a great. He always does a great job in his reporting of kind of condensing things. Um, and you can see he goes around and finds different impact zones. Um, so go watch it because the Israeli military apparently does not want us watching this. 
Um, so Aaron Mate, who's another journalist for The Gray Zone, he wrote on Twitter, quote, Israel is detaining and prosecuting an American journalist for doing journalism. Will his media colleagues defend him? End quote. And again, you saw after Gershkovitz, and, and that's just the one example I'm thinking of, you know, there's just this uniform call from the from the mainstream press to for Russia to release him. And we still haven't seen anything about Lafredo. There's been a few stories here and there. This is like Ynet, which is an Israeli site, wrote it up and basically just bought the IDF narrative that, you know, he was he was. Uh, uh, what were the charges that he's aiding the enemy? Um, so an independent journalist who was arrested alongside Lafredo but has since been released, said that they were beaten and blindfolded by the Israeli military. So this is someone who goes by Andre X on Twitter, or X as it's known now. Um, He said, quote, Today I was beaten, kidnapped, blindfolded, and taken to a military base by the Israeli occupation forces, together with four other journalists. Two of us were held for 11 hours without charges. My phone was confiscated, and one of us is still in custody, end quote. And that's um, Jeremy he's referring to there. So Kit Clarenberg, a British journalist, he's also a contributor to the Gray Zone. He is asking people to contact the U.S. Embassy in Israel, and they have the the emails in this story here. It's Jerusalem ACS at state.gov. So contact them and let them know that you are displeased that they arrested Jeremy and say that the the U.S. government, you know, should call for his release. Um, And, you know, considering everything that they give Israel, you know, you would think they would be a little more careful arresting, uh, doing this to an American journalist. But um, I'm sure that they know a lot of people in the U.S., in the U.S. government are probably on their side on this. But hopefully people make enough of a stink about this that he can get get released and he has a lot of other good work um jeremy from on the ground in the west bank in in jerusalem uh, near gaza so definitely go check his stuff out all right so the next one here the jewish state will extend from jerusalem to damascus according to bezalel smotrich so this article is from the cradle in a new documentary Israeli minister Bezalel Smotrich detailed his desire to conquer not only all Palestinian territories to the Jordan River, but also the Syrian capital of Damascus and territories extending as far as Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Smotrich, the finance minister in the Israeli cabinet and head of the religious Zionism party, made the comments in a recently released documentary entitled Israel Extremists in Power. The documentary was produced by Uh, a Franco-German broadcast news magazine. Um, And when asked about his goals, Smotrich tells the interviewer, quote, I want a Jewish state. It is a country run according to the values of the Jewish people. Uh, End quote. Uh, Israel currently controls territory from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River, including the Palestinian territories in the West Bank, which have been under Israeli military occupation since 1967. Israel has been building illegal Jewish settlements on stolen Palestinian land in the West Bank ever since. The interviewer then asked Smotrich whether he thought the borders of the Jewish state should extend past the Jordan River. Smotrich responded by saying, quote, Absolutely, but slowly. Our great religious elders used to say that the future of Jerusalem was to extend as far as Damascus, end quote. The documentary narrator then then added, quote, Bezalel Smotrich has a maximalist vision of the promised land, and it includes all Palestinian lands, but also territories in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt, even in Saudi Arabia, a radical vision, admittedly, but one that is accepted in public debate in Israel, end quote. And Smotrich, besides being the finance minister, he also has a minister position in the defense ministry that gives him the power to expand West Bank settlements. And we've seen him do that lately and, uh, you know, demolish Palestinian structures and things like that. And, you know, he says in this interview that they're going to do it bit by that they want to do it bit by bit, bit by bit. So right now, obviously, they're looking to conquer Gaza, um, the West Bank. And uh, it looks like people like Smotrich also want southern Lebanon. They want to slice off um, southern Lebanon. Who knows? They might want the whole the whole territory of Lebanon. 
Um, but that is definitely part of the thinking here, at least f from some people within the Israeli government. All right, so the next one here, the UK denies Zelensky's request on long-range strikes. So we have some good good news here today. Uh, so Zelensky met with British Prime Minister Keir Starmer in London on Thursday and again asked for permission to use British-provided missiles for long-range strikes inside Russian territory, but was denied. A spokesman for Starmer said that the UK has not lifted the restriction on Storm Shadow missiles, which have a range of about 155 miles, and added that, quote, no war has ever been won by a single weapon, and there's no change in the government's policy on the use of long-range missiles, end quote. So according to Zelensky's office, the Ukrainian leader emphasized to Starmer the need to obtain permission to strike deep, in, deep into Russian territory. Um, so last month, the U.S. and the U.K. looked like they were ready to sign off on this. And, and it's more than just giving Ukraine permission. It would be direct NATO support for these long-range strikes because they need intelligence from NATO. And we know that there's some British soldiers on the ground in Ukraine actually helping fire these uh, storm shadow missiles. So it would be direct participation in attacks deep inside Russia. Putin said that this step would put NATO in a direct war with Russia and later order changes to Russia's nuclear doctrine that lower the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons. So it looks like they got the message, at least for now, um, which is good. Uh, and Zelensky also met with Mark Ru Ruda, I forget, I, I might be getting his name wrong again. Mark Ruda, the former Dutch prime minister, um, who is the new head of NATO. He replaced, um, what's his name? Stoltenberg, Jan Stoltenberg. How could I forget his name? And he kind of also downplayed the idea of the long range strikes while he was there. He said, quote, let's not focus on one system, one weapon system at all. It will not be one weapon system, which will make the change, end quote. Um, so he, he did also express some support for NATO allowing the long-range strikes, insisting that it was legal, but he said that it was up to individual countries. And it does look like, for now, the U.S. and the U.K. are not going to sign off on this. All right, so the next one here. A U.S. general says that Ukraine needs longer-range missiles. So this is, this is uh, kind of not good. <laughs> Uh, this is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. The top U.S. military commander in Europe said that long-range cruise missiles were among the weapon systems that are crucial to send to Ukraine. CNN obtained an annex from a classified report compiled by Commander of European Command General Chris Cavoli that lists weapons platforms that Kiev does not currently have that could benefit Ukraine. The list includes Lockheed Martin's joint air-to-surface standoff missiles, the JASMs, that's a cruise missile fired from F-16s which with a range of 230 miles. There were some reports saying that uh, the U.S. was going to give them those missiles soon, but we, we still haven't seen it. Um, at least, you know, we haven't seen them publicly say that they're sending them. Additionally on the list is Link-16, which is a data sharing network used by the U.S. and NATO. While Cavalli did not explain in his report when Ukraine... Uh, has not received the weapons. Sources told CNN that Link 16 is being withheld over concerns the technology could fall into Russian hands. So officials told the outlet that the White House has not signed off on the JASM, the, those are the cruise missile transfers, because it assesses that the missiles will not be useful to Ukraine until Kiev has air superiority, um, which they are obviously a very long way off from having that. Um, all right, so the last one here, China hits out at Taiwan leader's speech. So this article is from the South China Morning Post and just kind of an update on the tensions between uh, Taiwan's new president and China. This is kind of an area that I really want to cover more because I think it's important, uh, you know, the situation with China when you have the U.S. openly preparing for war, war with China. It's something we should keep an eye on. And I also just have always thought, China, East, you know, Asia in general, that part of the world is just very interesting. Um, but this is from the South China Morning Post. Uh, and so William Lai ching the Taiwanese president who came in this year, he gave a very defiant speech um, saying some things about China. And China responded saying that it showcased stubborn Taiwan independence. So Lai used the speech on the annual double 10th day 
to say the two sides are not subordinate to each other and Beijing had no authority to represent the island. He said, quote, the Republic of China has already settled down in Taiwan, Kuomoi, Matsu, and Pengue, and it is not subordinate to the People's Republic of China, end quote. So the Republic of China, that's the official name for Taiwan. Um, so a lot of people don't understand that the One China policy, you know, the the DPP, Lai is a member of the DPP, and they're, they're kind of going away from this idea. But the official stance, really, of Taiwan's government is that they're China. They're the one China. You know, so it's not just China that says that. You know, I think a lot of people don't get that. Um, and the, use, the U.S. used to recognize Taiwan as China and not recognize uh, China, you know, mainland China before ni- the 1970s. Um, so Lai said, quote, on this land, democracy and freedom are growing and thriving. The People's Republic of China has no right to represent Taiwan. And quote, um, he called for healthy and orderly dialogue and exchanges between the two sides, saying that he would continue to maintain the cross strait status quo while upholding his commitment to resist annexation or encroachment. Um, so uh, China's response, you know, obviously they're not going to be happy about this. Um, so Mao Ning, who's a spokeswoman for the Chinese foreign ministry said that Lai was quote, deliberately seeking to sever the historical connection between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait by repeating the rhetoric, China and Taiwan are not subordinate to each other. And that Taiwan has sovereignty. Lai Ching Te tries to repackage and promote the fallacy of Taiwan independence End quote. And so whenever you see China kind of issuing its warnings, about Taiwan, they say Taiwanese independence, um, and and it's uh, I forget the exact wording that they use, um, but the people encouraging uh, you know the outside influence encouraging the Taiwan independence. Obviously, when they say that, they're talking about um, the U.S. And this is an issue that the U.S. is very involved in because they are giving really increasing support for Taiwan and kind of egging them, you know, egging the D- DPP on on this. Um, this position that they have. Uh, so that's it for the news. One thing uh, that I have to mention um, that I did not mention yesterday is that Ramsey Baroud, who's a longtime contributor to antiwar.com, uh, we run his columns all the time. Scott Horton interviews him all the time. Uh, he lost his sister. The Israeli military killed his sister in Gaza. Um, and this was a post that he put up on Wednesday who said... Um, his sister, Dr. Soma Baroud, she was killed. The Israeli military bombed her taxi in the Khan Yunus area, killing her and six other innocent people. Um, uh, so, you know, he says it's more accurate to say that she was assassinated. You know, there's always the possibility of Israel, because we, we talked about that journalist the other day, this 19 year old kid who was getting threatening messages on whatsapp and then a couple days later he the israeli military kills him you know ramsey uh he runs the palestine chronicle um and over this past year i mean they've been relentless in their criticism of of what israel has been doing and ramsey is very well known um as an outspoken critic of israel and you know it's not out of the question that they would purposely target his family um, just based on what we've seen israel do over the past year just complete barbarity um, so, uh, tough loss, uh, for, for Ramsey. Um, so go check out our viewpoints. We have one from Ramsey, uh, a year of genocide, despite the unbelievable pain, Palestinians emerge stronger. One from Edward Hasbrook, military draft signups plunge as war fear, war fears rise. One from William Hartung, weapons stocks blast off as bombs drop, troops invade Lebanon. One from Julie Hollar, media urge expansion of Ukraine war, nuclear risk be damned. Uh, the spotlight is from Feroz Sidhwa, doctors, nurses, paramedics, what we saw in Gaza. So this is from the New York Times, and this is just another account from doctors and nurses, American doctors and nurses and paramedics who volunteered in Gaza and just the, the horrors that they saw and it talks a lot about the bullets, the you know children, young children being shot in the head, um, and uh, they have a lot of different accounts. Definitely go check this out. 
uh, go through the link at antiwar.com. Um, you could scroll through it and just see all these um, different doctors and their quotes. Let's just read a few here. Dr. Kawaja Ikram uh, said, quote, one day while in the ER, I saw a three-year-old and a five-year-old, each with a single bullet hole to their head. When asked what happened, their father and brother said they had been told that Israel was backing out of Khan Yunus, so they returned to see if anything was left of their house. There was, they said, a sniper waiting who shot both children. Israeli sniper shooting a three-year-old and a five-year-old in the head. Um, here's another one, Dr. Aliyah Katan, quote, I saw an 18-month-old little girl with a gunshot wound to the head, end quote. So, I mean, this goes on and on. And uh, it's just absolutely horrific. And the fact that this isn't changing anything, that these accounts from these doctors isn't getting the U.S. to stop this, it just goes to show that they're just 100% complicit and supportive of all of these atrocities. Um, so that is it. That's everything for the week. I actually, so actually, there's actually going to be another episode of anti-war news coming out on Saturday. I did another interview, um, with a man named Kegum Balian. He is a Jerusalemite Armenian. He lives in the old city of East Jerusalem in the Armenian quarter, and they've been facing pressure from Israeli settlers, um, and an Israeli real estate company. They're trying to move in on their, uh, property. Um, so he came on my show to talk about that. So I'm going to put that out on Saturday. Definitely check it out and share it. Um, I think anyone who listens to this show will be very interested in hearing that story. Um, so that'll be out Saturday, I think around noon, uh, Eastern time here in the U S it's going to be posted. So keep an eye out for that again, help us with our fundraiser. If you can antiwar.com slash donate, um, I will be back with the new show next week and uh, definitely check out the interview that will be posted on Saturday. I'm going to try to do some more interviews more frequently than every few months. Um, I have a few ideas in mind, so I think we'll start seeing that more, me posting an interview here and there on uh, Saturdays. Um, but anyway, uh, that is it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>